Thank you. Good morning. The average patient on dialysis will spend over 600 hours a year in a chair tethered to a machine with the goal of cleansing their blood of fluid and toxins uh, in order for them to survive. Uh, my name is Nikhil Sean, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Nephrodite, and, and we're developing an implantable, continuous functioning, implantable and wearable device that would allow patients to experience some of the things that they greatest, greatest, most greatest search for, which is mobility, portability, uh, improved health outcomes, and quality of life. This matters to us uh, because myself and my co-founder, Hip Nguyen, uh, have deep bench experience in, in the transplant space, and as surgeons, we took care of these patients uh, for many years. And we understood the needs that patients had in terms of uh, the, the risk factors associated with their disease, the complications, the side effects, uh, and it was very impactful for us both. Given that, plus our experience in medical device uh, a, throughout the years, we were able to put a team together that we really think is, is pretty fantastic in terms of the R&D, IP, regulatory, and the entire effort that it takes uh, in order to push something like this uh, forward. Our inspiration came from a young lady who was actually one of our patients who was suffering from kidney disease and ultimately went on dialysis. And it was many years in and out of the hospital with complications, uh, failure to thrive, depression, really, really emotionally battered and battle-hardened. And she waited years for, for a kidney transplant um, and ultimately got them, but, but continued to reject them because of the issues of, of all the years on dialysis. But what she expressed to us was the fact that she was always sick, always tired. She was scared. And you can imagine big needles coming at a young patient and all of the things of going in and out of a hospital. She just wanted to be normal. She wanted to be on the playground, wanted to have play dates. And this impacted us. And, and as we continue to look at the industry, we, we know that, that uh, the impact is tremendous overall. This is a huge, huge burden to Medicare. Uh, there's a number of patients that are continuing to live longer, and this continues to impact not, not only every patient provider, but also the health system alone. And so we believe that with the changes coming with the federal mandate in 2019 to push forward kidney health, we believe that these are all forwarding new innovations such as ours. When we polled patients and asked them about what their biggest issues were with, with their condition, they really identified three main areas that they had problems with. One was the intermittency of treatment, three times per week going to the dialysis center, complications in and out, constantly worried whether their graft or their fistula was going to fail and have to go back to the hospital and get a, a central venous catheter, all the mental health issues that almost always don't get addressed. Uh, these were issues for patients. The second issue that they identified was the access, and we've heard a lot about that today. The access in their arms or the PD catheters, the peritoneal catheters in their abdomens, are frequently blocked, obstructed, or subject to infection, which then causes a whole series of complications. And then the third thing that they identified, which was perhaps most impactful, was the fact that they had a lack of mobility. They were constantly tied to a chair, whether they were at home or in a center, and, and they would trade they actually said this, they would trade 10 years of living on dialysis as they currently do for just one year of being able to live more free and independent. So our inspiration really came initially from a heart device, an LVAD, a left ventricular assist device. And as we saw this device, uh, we started to ask the question, could we be the LVAD for kidney? Could we develop a continuous functioning device that could at a minimum be a bridge to transplant, perhaps at most also be a standalone device. And so what we wanted to do was meld what we knew was working for patients on the peritoneal dialysis side, the fact that they could be at home and that they could be more independent, but less efficient, right, on, on the PD side, but take hemodialysis, which we know was very efficient, functions like our kidney, and could we blend those two concepts together? And what we came up with was this depiction of, of our device. So what you can see here is our device is about the size of a small child's fist. It's a three-chambered device with membranes inside. Those are proprietary to our company. The device would be sewn directly to the vascular space. We want to stay out of the abdomen, so the extra peritoneal space of the pelvis. Uh, we would sew directly to that. And the central chamber is the blood chamber. This would allow and facilitate flow through the body's own physiology, through the heart rate and cardiac output, with blood flowing continuously through our device. 
Connected on either side are two chambers that are the dialysate chambers. And there's tubing that exits the dialysate chambers and exits the body to connect to a wearable. And here you see a vest. There could also be a backpack. And that vest would, be pow would have a power source. It would also have um, a, a reservoir. And that reservoir, through a micro pump on the wearable, would pump the dialysate into the device and allow for the exchange of not only toxins like urea, but also for water exchange. So what have we done so far? Our early, in our early uh, stages of non-dilutional funding, where we were in our discovery phase, we took our, our efforts to say, could we compress a large dialyzer into a small device that of the size of a small child's fist? Could we surgically implant that? Uh, would we be able to have the efficiency of dialysis over time? Uh, and we were able to show that through our early studies and proof of concept. We then took that and did more advanced testing with blood uh, on the bench, both human and animal blood, to see if we were also meeting the same criteria. And ultimately, we went into sedated animals acutely and, and put our device in those animals to see if we could efficiently uh, work our device, have resilience as well as function and filtering and water exchange. We have three phases of development currently. Uh, our implantable device, the hemofiltration device, is where our IP mostly sits. Uh, we have a second phase that we're working on the wearable, whether in case this case a vest or a backpack, uh, that would also include the reservoir or micro pump. And then we have a third effort that goes on in our R&D that's dedicated solely to the electronics, the sensors, uh, all the data acquisition, uh, as well as uh, remote patient monitoring. We, we absolutely feel that, that there, are other, there are other innovations in this space, but there really has been a paucity of innovation in the renal care space, and all of us in this space agree upon that. And so we really feel that since the 2019 uh, push forward from the federal mandate, that this is really an opportunity for us to not only get together, but to collaborate. We wanted to address a continuous functioning of device, uh, one that uh, eliminates access problems, specifically in the arm or the abdomen, that, and it allowed for ambulatory uh, issues and, and portability for patients. As we've done that, uh, we have a, 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 a patent estate that we, uh, that we have that currently involves three core families. But what we've really done with uh, outside of the six issued patents and one on the way is that we've really started to address our future and generational IP filings, and I've been really excited about is that as well. Uh, in terms of uh, our regulatory approach, we have a full regulatory uh, consideration uh, that we put forward. We are really using the LVAD experiences uh, to mimic ours as it is a vascular device and it's an implantable one. So we've looked at both the VAD space as well as other areas to really map out our, our direction in terms of uh, regulatory approval. While we understand that this is a class three device and obviously it would be a de novo application as we don't feel there's a predicate device out there, uh, we do feel that there's enough out there in terms of uh, the pathway that we've uh, described uh, as well as the push federally uh, to get us through in terms of CMS and um, the FDA. We have uh, validated some key assumptions by looking at the space not only from the cardiac implantable side but also home hemodialysis and other uh, PMA devices that have been out there. And we feel that we've really taken that into consideration as we estimate our funding needs, with our milestones and all captured with our relative timelines. In terms of where we're headed next, we have uh, last year raised a seed round. We're currently raising a Series A, and that would be to get us to MVP. Uh, and we look forward to talking to people uh, about uh, our journey along creating a fully, uh, an implantable and continuous functioning renal replacement device. Thank you. <laughs>